Hi all, today we will learn a more advanced technique to control registers in ROP. Uh, in 32-bit ROP, uh, we can put arguments on the stack, so as long as we have a pop n number of uh, registers and then the return instruction, then for example pop return, pop pop return, pop 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 return, so then like we can uh, put the arguments of we can call the functions with the like the that n number of the arguments that we have like the pop instructions and then return gadgets are yeah so the, we can uh, uh, call any functions with the, that n arguments if we have a uh, gadgets to pop the registers so such pop instructions are definitely included in the program because the push registers at the head of the function and then pop registers at the end of the function. Yeah, these are this is a, like the well-defined assembly coding patch pattern to save and restore uh, register values. So for example, suppose you call a function, you make a function call it here, and then it will run some of the function. While running the function, it will use some of the register values, but to not to ruin the register state of the like the caller, uh, what this function can do is like it will push all the register that it will use on the stack, and then pop before returning the function to restore the all the values. So the, this kind of the pattern is quite common, so you can easily find uh, this kind of the pop 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 return. So, for example, if you have like a four uh, argument. Uh, if you have like a pop 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 return like this, then then you can up, uh, call up to four argument functions arbitrarily. Uh, uh, if your buffer size allows for the uh, running the stack. So in 32-bit, what matters uh, to such ROP gadgets uh, was the number of the pops before the return. However, in 64-bit, the operand of the pop instruction matters. Uh, that is uh, because like the, we need to uh, pass the argument values uh, with this specific register. So for example, to pass the first argument, we need a pop RDI and return gadget. And to pass the second argument, we need a pop RSI R15 and then return. Yeah, we need to change the value of the RSI from the value on the stack. And then the, for the third argument, we need to we need uh, instructions that the pop RDX, fourth argument, pop RCX, and so on. Yeah. So what matters is that uh, pop RDX uh, because uh, so we can easily find a pop RDI uh, we can call the argument uh, functions with the one argument and then we can also easily find a pop RDI and a pop RSI because these uh, two things are like the commonly used thing in the function and uh, to call a function with the three arguments, which is in exact VE, then we need to control RDI and RSA, RSI, and at the same time, we need we need to control the RDX. But the problem is like the pop RDX is not existing much in the uh, program. So. So the problem is that uh, in the most of the program, uh, pro this is in a ROP gadget output of the like the uh, uh, some uh, some of the challenges that we were solving, and then like the, in the challenge you can easily find the pop RDX and return instruction because I intentionally uh, inserted this instruction as an inline assembly. So because of the this line, yeah, you can see uh, these like the instructions. But uh, in a usual case, in the real binary program without this line, uh, you cannot find the pop RDX uh, at anywhere. Yeah. So this is the ROP gadget status of the usual case, and then you can find the pop RSI, pop RDI, RVP, but uh, some other R13, 14, 15, but not about the, the RDI at all, uh, RDX at all. Yeah. And what is the problem with the RDX? Uh, Suppose you know the address of the exact VE in the program, then you want to call that function. To do that, you can set the RDI as the address of the some of the string uh, for the like the, the uh, program name or program path, and then set RSI and RDX as a zero to ignore the argument vector and then the environment variable pointer. So we need to set three arguments. 
So we can s easily set the RDI and RSI from this uh, common gadget, but uh, there's no pop RDX, then like how can he set the third argument? Uh, to do that, uh, we can utilize a hidden function in the C program, which is a libc CSU in it. And before getting into the detail, uh, let me explain about the purpose of this function first. The purpose of this function is to call all the constructors that defined in the program at the start of the program. And I'm not sure how many of you already know about like there's a constructor function in the C program. And its syntax is something like this. So you can define a function with the attribute uh, constructor. Uh, then this function will be called right after the program is loaded, even before the main function executes. So in this example, if I run, if I write a program that has a, like the main function, it will print out hi i main. So it'll just print out the function main, and then I, I put a, another uh, printf here with the constructor. So it will print out the hi i'm a constructor. Yeah. Then if I run the uh, program, then like it, it will print out uh, I'm a constructor first, even before running the main function. So to support the, this this kind of feature for the initialization before the running the program, um, the old C program has uh, this function. Yeah. So the, to handle such functionality, the actual program running uh, loading sequence. Uh, is uh, something like the following. So at the program loading, uh, it will run the start of the program. Uh, the, it will run at the program's uh, entry uh, point, and then uh, it will call libc start main. Then internally, it will call libc init first, and then libc init, then libc csu init, and it will call all the constructors in the program and uh, even if we don't have constructors, this function exists in the program because the, an interesting point is that although we do not have the constructors in the most of the C program, uh, this kind of the pattern, uh, uh, this uh, like the having the libc CSU in it, yeah, in the program is the standard in the C and the ELF format. Uh, so libc start main uh, calls this function, so we must have uh, this function uh, defined in the binary. So the some of the restriction is that in the ELF format with the libc, uh, linked with the libc, it requires a this function. So we can safely assume that the gadgets that we can collect from this function is always there for the binary program. So that's why this is important. Because we will borrow uh, wrap gadgets from this kind of fixed function. So we just learned that the libc CSU unit is always there in the C binary program. Then uh, take a look at the uh, what kind of the instructions that there. So this is the disassembly of the libc CSU unit, and then our interested parts are like the uh, these are pops and return. So pop rbx, rbp, r12, r13, r14, and r15. And then if we split these r14 and r15, uh, then the, we can even find uh, some other uh, pop instructions such as a uh, pop rdi and return. So 703, so splitting the r15, and then 701 by splitting the r14, we can get pop rsi, and then pop r15, and then return. Yeah. Then our interest is uh, controlling rdx. At here. Uh, we can uh, the instruction moves the value of the R chain to RDX, but we can control the value of the R13 at here. That means uh, we can change the value of the R13, then that then will be moved to RDX, and uh, change the value of the R14 here, and it will be moved to RSI, and then change the value of the R15, then that then will be moved to EDI. Then we can set RDI, RSI, RDX value, and then it will call the function. So if we can call exactly here, then we can set all three arguments and then call the function. So this gadget could be utilized for the uh, running the exact be the three argument function, even if we do not have pop RDX. And let's focus on the top part again. Uh, it first sets uh, R13 to RDX. So if we set the R13 as a zero at here, then, then we can make uh, RDX as a zero. Then it will set R14 as an RSI. So if we set zero for R14 here, 
and it will set RSI as a zero. And then the, it will set R15D, set the lower 32 bit of the R15 to the lower 32 bit of the RDI, which is EDI. Then, like if we previously make a uh, using pop R15 and pop RDI, if we set the, these two values as the same, then, then this uh, instruction actually does nothing because uh, these two values are the same. Yeah. So that we can preset all these values for pre, uh, before running this instruction to nullify the effect of the, this instruction at all. And then uh, after that, uh, it will call the R15, R12, RBX, and 8. And then let's uh, dive into these uh, the semantic of the this instruction. So what it will do is like it, it will uh, use R12 as an address that stores an array of the pointer, and then RBX as the index, and then uh, the array size is at eight bytes because it's a function pointer. So it will use R12 as a function pointer array, and then index that with the RBX multiplied by A, and then call that the location as a, a function address. Yeah. So the important point here is that, that there's a asterisk here. Uh, this means that, like it will dereference yeah, the R12. So uh, to make the case easily, uh, we can simply set RBX as a zero. Uh, when we pop using this pop instructions. In that case, uh, we can make the entire, the, this multiply by A as a, a zero, then it will just do reference to R12, and then it will get the, the address of the function from R12 and call that function. So by setting the R12 to the sum of the address, then we can call the function, then maybe we can set the R12 as an EXECD, but that will not work. So we can get easily get the address of the EXECVE like this, but the suppose we set the R12 and EXECVE and then run at this point. Then what will happen is, so it will dereference the target pointer, and if we dereference the pointer, we will get the sum of the values like the 0B5A25FF something. So it will call the function address at here, which is a the non-existent function at all, so it will generate the segmentation fault. So instead of just setting the R12 as the address of the EXECVE, uh, we need to set the R12 as the address that contains the address of the EXECVE in the memory. Is there any memory flaw for this? Yes, there is. And then before getting to the answer, Let's learn about this uh, one more concept uh, called the procedure linkage table. So if you attach GDB to the program and before running the program, uh, if you run the printf, uh, print printf to check the address of the printf, then you will see this address. The address in the code section of the program, so that's why it's uh, 40005A0. Uh, yeah. And then it says, printf at plt and so this means that the, this is the address of the printf at the procedure linkage table in the code section and after you running the program uh, if you run the print printf again then you will see the real address of the printf in the library space yeah. then what is plt so to call a function the program need to know the address of the target function. But the problem is that uh, when we uh, do the ASRL and then like the, because we don't know the uh, setup of the target system uh, as a program a programmer, so a compiler don't know the address of the libc functions. So uh, you, the program don't know like the which version of the libc you will use. So like the function address might be changing uh, depending on the version of the uh, library, so we don't know the address of the printf, and it can also be randomized, so we don't know that. Then, how can you find? So, to call the function, we need to know the address, but uh, I just said that like that we don't know the, where the printf function in the library space is. Yeah, so in that case, how can we make a function call? And to this end, uh, plt exists. And to dive into plt, Let's take a look at the disassemble 
of the, the instructions in the PLT addresses. So this address is a print template PLT, and then if you disassemble that, disassemble the three instructions of that, then it will say uh, it jumps to the uh, the value difference in the address 601030. The reason why this address is 601030 is that like the this offset added by the next instruction uh, because the RIP will always point to the, the next instruction. So if we add these and that, then it will get like a 601030. Yeah. So what it will do is it will directly jump to the uh, address stored at the 601030. Then uh, maybe you want to put the address of the 601030 to R12, then it will difference that data then it will call printf because we are basically doing the same thing with the printf plt then what's in 6010030 so this is the disassembly of the printf and then the from the plt we get the this address and if we examine the that address then we can see the actual the function address in the library space this is the address of the printf we can see that value in this uh, 601030. So how it works is as follows. To call a function, we need a fixed or relatively fixed location for the function uh, from the code section. So to have a such location in the, uh, for calling dynamic, dynamic, dynamic library functions such as a printf, uh, we assign the printf procedure linkage table in the code section. So, which means like it, it will be either fixed in non PIE or like the relatively fixed to the code section of the program uh, because the, this area uh, is a part of the code section. Then it will jump, uh, it will call the PLT, and what PLT does is it will jump to the sum of the address. And uh, this address. For storing the address of the like the actual library function uh, address uh, is called a global offset table. So uh, PLT is linked with the the one of the global offset table entry, so entry for printf, and then the this GOT entry of the printf will store the actual address of the printf. So the call chain is uh, something like a, we will call printf PLT first. Then it will refer to the printf the GOT. Then the GOT stores the address of the printf in the libc, and it will finally call printf in the libc function. And to depict this as a diagram, so we will have a printf call in the program's code section, and it will first call make a, to make a function called printf. It will first uh, make a function call to plt, and then. PLT will jump to the GOT and then GOT will store the address of the printf so it will finally make the function call uh, to printf in the library space. Then, so GOT entry, each of the GOT entry will store the, the address of the target function so that we will have a, a one GOT entry per each PLT and then we will have the PLT entries for the, the older fun library function that we are using. Then, you might be curious uh, how this kind of the uh, process can be uh, bootstrapped. So, uh, for instance, uh, at the start, what kind of the values will be in GOT and then how can we uh, fill the actual function address? And this is done in a lazy manner as follows. So at the start, all the GOT entries uh, will store the value of the uh, resolve function. Yeah. And uh, what this function does is it will basically call the DL dynamic resolve and it will find the address of the, this function by the function name. So what it will do is like the free call printf and then it will query that where the address of the printf in the library function is and then it will let the, this program know by putting the address of the pro, uh, printf to the GOT entry. So 
the execution will uh, be done as follows. So it will first call the printf plt, then it will jump to the got, then it will call dl dynamic resolve, and then it will get the address of the printf at the got, and then jump to there. Then now we have the address of the, the real printf here, so the next time if we call plt, then it will call the address of the printf in got, which is the address of the libc. So this is how uh, plt and got works together to uh, resolve the dynamic binding of the, this kind of the library addresses. So this global offset table uh, is stored at the some of the data section and it's near the 8049 something or 6010 something uh, in the uh, uh, data section of the, uh, the program. Yeah. And then the, uh, if these areas are fixed because it's included in the program, if the program is not PIE, but if the program is PIE, then, then you can leak the code address, then you can get the, all the relative fixed offset uh, to these areas. And uh, the, at the start, uh, it will store the address of the DL dynamic result, but uh, on its invocation, then it will call the DL dynamic result with the, its function name, and then put the function address in the GOT, and then later, it will directly use the depth value instead of the, the doing resolve again and again. So this resolve is done all one time, and then the, after calling the function, the function address will be in the uh, program's GOT. And to find the GOT entries, uh, you can find that from the read ELF A output. So you can see that the uh, these kind of the uh, right read uh, these are. Uh, this kind of the, the relative uh, PLT uh, section, uh, you can take a look at the uh, where the, each of the GOT entries are there. Yeah. So for EXECVE, uh, for the search and like it's challenge binary, then you can find that at the GOT entry at the 601030. Then let's get back to controlling RDX and invoking exec VE. So we will use uh, these pub instructions to set the values of the registers and then run this code snippet to run exactly with this call instruction. So to control RDX, so we can set R13 as a zero, then that will make RDX as a zero, and R14 as a zero at here, then it will set RSI zero, and then we will set the R15 and RDI as the same value uh, point to the sum of the string, then like the this introduction will do nothing. And then we will set to make this call instruction to call the exec PE, we will set the R12 as a GOT of the exec PE. Then it will invoke the, uh, before that, the, we will also set the RBX as a zero, then it will refer to the GOT of the exe CVE, and then get the address and then call the function so it will call either the DL resolve for the EXECVE or calling the EXECVE itself. So we can set all three arguments and then call exactly. So for ROP 664 uh, the challenge program does not include pop RDX and so the difficult part is that you need to figure out like, how you can control the a value of the RDX using the gadgets in the libc CSU unit. And by controlling R13, 14, 15, and RBX and R12, then you can make uh, all the register value set as like the, your own choice, and then call the exec VE. Then you can run the program in the program set regi ID and exec VE bin SH, then you can get the flag. And for ROP5 challenges, uh, for 32-bit and 64-bit, uh, the challenge binary includes the PLTs of the functions of the put, print, read, PRC, TRL, string, copy, info function, and main, but there's no open nor exec PE, so that means that you cannot read, open, or run program to read the flag. And how can you get a shell and read the flag? 
So for this, uh, you can approach this challenge as you did similar in like the ASR4 challenges. Uh, that means, so after the program, so the program will internally call printf. And after the program calls uh, printf, then it will store the address of the printf at the GOT entry of the printf. So that means if you can build a wrap chain to call printf with this address or this address in 32-bit, then it will leak the address of the printf in libc. So by doing that, you can get the address of the printf in libc, and we can do the same thing in AS04. So if you know the offset between the exact VE and the printf from the libc binary, then you can calculate the actual address of the exact VE from the address of the printf. Then you can call exact VE directly. So uh, recall the ASR4 challenge. So your tasks to solve the ROP5 challenges are uh, you need to leak the address of the printf by calling printf uh, got of the printf. And then you can convert that into integer value and use that as an address and then calculate the uh, address of the exact VE by adding the offset. And then return to the input function again because you need to exploit the variability again to use this address. Then at the second time you exploit the program, then you will use the address of the exact VE uh, to run the run and uh, run the shell. And this is the end of the lecture uh, today. And the tutorial in the following tutorial, I will demonstrate how you can solve a ROP 532 and ROP 664.